We'll get started. I'm David Sanger from the New York Times, and uh, this is the Hardy uh, group that has made it through to the last uh, full session. And it's also on the topic that we've been talking our way around for a day and a half, but haven't really talked about directly, which is what is happening now at what's one of the most fascinating moments in the 30 some odd years I've covered negotiations, threats, everything in between about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and North Korea's own weapons program. And while we can't promise you um, significant answers here, because I think I probably speak for everybody on the stage when I say that we have been consistently surprised over the past year and a half, uh, both with um, the speed and success of Kim Jong-un's testing program last year, and certainly with the speed of the diplomacy so far this year. Um, we'll try to do our best to raise the questions and the things to look for as we head toward this fascinating summit meeting on Friday to be followed, uh, as President Trump says, if it happens, uh, with the Trump-Kim meeting. So let me tell you who was on our panel here today. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, your, uh, your right, uh, Kim Jun Kyung, the Professor of International Studies, Languages, and Literature at Handong Global University, who uh, had directed the um, Security and Diplomacy Center at the Korea Institute for Future Strategies. He's a former Fulbright uh, visiting scholar at George Mason and uh, has worked at various points for President Moon in his previous runs uh, for president. Um, Andre Lankov is uh, sitting next to him, professor at the College of Social Studies at uh, Cookman University. Uh, he has um, written some of the most perceptive uh, things I've uh, read about um, the world of strategic decision making inside North Korea. He's contributed to the Wall Street Journal, the Times, the Financial Times, and used to teach Korean history at Australian National University. Uh, in the middle of the group is uh, an old friend of mine, Gary Seymour, Executive Director for Research at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs uh, at Harvard. He um, uh, previously has been uh, President Obama's White House Coordinator for Arms Control and Weapons of Mass Destruction. He had a very similar role uh, for President Clinton. He was Director of Studies and Senior Fellow for Nonproliferation at the International Institute for Strategic Studies um, in London. And um, years and years ago, uh, when he was a grad student, taught me whatever little I know on this subject. So if I'm getting, getting anything wrong today, blame it all on Gary. Um, uh, Tanaka Hitoshi uh, is the Chairman of the Institute for International Strategy at the Japan Research Institute. Uh, was a senior fellow at the Japan Center for International Exchange and was a deputy minister for foreign affairs. And I think uh, Tanaka-san, we first met when I was uh, still based in Tokyo. So uh, uh, it's been, been a while. And um, uh, Zhao uh, Quancheng, John Quancheng is professor of uh, international relations uh, and chair of the Asian studies program at American University. He's the author of Interpreting Chinese Foreign Policy and uh, was a member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, has been a visiting professor at uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts and at Fudan University and Korea University, among others. So, um, Gary, let me start uh, with you. So, um, tell us if you think that Kim Jong-un is serious about denuclearization the phrase that we've heard used and thrown around here. And then tell us what you think President Trump is up to as he veers from uh, Little Rocket Man last summer and Fire and Fury, which made many here uh, in Seoul fear that he was uh, on the verge of uh, pushing what he called the bigger button on his desk, <laughs> to yesterday's um, remarkable statement during a photo op that he thought that Kim Jong-un, uh, a man who was executed uh, 
more people than we can count had acted very honorably in, uh, in recent days. Uh, seemed to be quite a veering from one place to another. So in terms of you know, Kim Jong-un's uh, motivation and intent, I find it impossible to believe that he's prepared to give up what his grandfather and his father worked so hard to bequeath to him and which the North Koreans view as essential to their survival, their security, and their status. Nonetheless, I'm happy that we're pursuing a diplomatic approach because I think it's at least conceivable that Kim Jong-un would be willing to accept real limits on his nuclear and missile capability, A, in order to get sanctions relief and economic assistance as he shifts to a strategy that tries to improve the economy, and B, because he may calculate that he has enough of a nuclear arsenal now to meet the country's national security requirements. And I think we'll find out very early in the process whether Kim Jong-un is serious about accepting real limits. And that will be whether the North Koreans are prepared to put on the table the nuclear facilities that are outside the Yongbyon Center. The North Koreans have allowed international inspection at the Yongbyon Center over the years. They claim those are their only nuclear facilities producing fissile material for nuclear weapons. We know that's not true. We know that they have additional nuclear facilities, which the North Koreans have never acknowledged, much less allowed to be inspected. If Kim Jong-un is prepared to make a declaration that at least passes the laugh test and puts on the table a real freeze of additional fissile material, then I think we might have an interesting negotiation about, what, about whether we could achieve a real cap on capability. Gary, do we know enough about the location and the nature of those other facilities that the US government or the South Korean government or the Japanese government will be able to declare whether they have passed the laugh test? I mean, as long as there are some facilities outside of Yongbyon, it will be the start of a conversation. I don't think anybody will necessarily believe that the declaration is full and complete without some verification process. But the U.S. has never publicly identified, if I have this right, the facilities outside. They've got lots of suspect locations, lots of places they'd love to inspect but they've never said, we believe you're enriching here or reprocessing there. Well, we don't want to tell the North Koreans what we know. I think it's up to them to tell us what they believe is a full and complete declaration, and then we'll compare that to what we believe we know, because obviously in the case of North Korea, one's information is always uh, somewhat you know, fragmentary and ambiguous. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it would be helpful for us to coach the North Koreans to make a declaration that we would then accept. It's better for them to take the first step and to acknowledge they have facilities outside Yongbyon that have never been uh, declared or inspected. And then we can start a conversation about whether that declaration is accurate. Okay, so the first part of my question was the least hard part of it, right. which is what's Kim Jong-un thinking? Yeah. The hardest part of that is what's Donald Trump thinking? So I think the, the Trump administration has you know, clearly laid out a very tough opening position for the negotiation, which is that North Korea has to perform 100% to U.S. satisfaction in terms of giving up their nuclear weapons and missile capabilities, and only then will they get paid in mm -hmm. terms of economic and political benefit. Now, that's obviously not a practical approach. Kim Jong-un is not going to accept that, but it's a reasonable opening position. But that very tough negotiating position seems to be married with President Trump's decision to have a summit with Kim Jong-un that will be very long on spectacle and very short on substance. Uh, and I expect the summit will take place. It's likely to issue a very broad and general political framework committing to achieve a nuclear-free Korean peninsula in the context of peace and normalization, and then assigning negotiators to actually try to work out the details, uh, in which case, as I said, we're going to, I think, very quickly run into a test of whether or not the, the, the North Koreans are serious. But I must say there's, um, and hopefully the, the summit would at least establish some time frame for trying to complete that negotiation, whether it's six months or nine months, just to try to set a deadline so they don't drag on forever. But I, when I talk to my South Korean and Japanese friends, I think there's a real concern that Trump 
whatever the script is will go off script and agree to something that would leave the allies exposed. Suppose Kim Jong-un offers to destroy all of his ICBMs in exchange for lifting all sanctions. I think there's a concern in Seoul and Tokyo that Trump would accept that offer. Uh, after all, America first. That would protect the United States, but it would leave the allies exposed to the remaining missiles and nuclear weapons. So I think there is some concern that Trump uh, will do something uh, very unexpected and very destructive at the summit, as opposed to uh, being happy with just uh, a spectacle and a good show. Good. Well, we'll go explore that question of their concerns a little more. So, um, uh, Mr. Kim, uh, Gary's given us a little bit of a vision into Kim Jong-un, a little bit of a vision into Donald Trump. The third player out here is um, your old advisee, uh, President Moon. Tell us what you think his strategy is going into this, and particularly going into Friday's um, talks. Okay. Um, actually, uh, as you introduced me, I, I, I joined 2012 presidential election team to advise him in foreign policy. And then, at the time, we lost. And 2016 and 17, I joined uh, again. And actually, I'm kind of an acting spokesperson outside government. They don't pay me much, but I'm enjoying this. So I- We'll I, put in for a raise okay. by the end of the talk okay, here. Okay. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm telling you that it, my uh, mention or my saying is not certified by him, but I'm sure uh, at least I can understand him. Okay, he is a really devoted to peace rather than the unification. And he want to be remembered as a peace builder in the Korean Peninsula. And I met him last week uh, at, uh, as a member of advisory committee for, for Inter-Korean Summit. And opening speech he made is, this is not over overnight dream. This has been my lifelong vision and especially he was the organizer or uh, organizer of the preparatory uh, team in 2007, so 11 years. Finally, he is going himself to negotiate. Okay. Before he was elected, he was kind of very cautious. And the biggest difference, I think, between Nomuyan and Moon Jae-in, many people suspected that Moon Jae-in is second coming of Nomuyan, <laughs> and especially from America. But he is more like a pragmatist. I think it's common denominator between these two, three leaders, even though it's different ideology, pragmatism. That's why I'm kind of positive. Still, I'm thinking all or nothing. But I don't think it's 5-5, five, 6-4, five, and 7-3. I'm positive. And I'm, I believe. And Moon said, uh, these days, whenever he sleeps, one side, on the one hand, is nervous, nervousness. At the same time, hopefulness. And he's he really, his fingers crossed. And I, I, I have the same feeling with him. Okay. I don't think he expected this speed either. I think nobody's. And I met the North Korean delegation in Helsinki right after. And U.S. accepted Kim Jong-un's offer to meet. And Che gang at the time, he said he, they're not prepared. They offered, but they didn't expect Trump took this early, the fast. So they're not ready. So everybody is a surprise. But we can notice that. And President Moon was much more cautious, but this, you know, as time go by, goes by, he's more uh, optimistic and speed up. He used to talk about staged gradual approach, and freeze first, and then dismantle later. But that was not ex accepted by, you know, uh, Japan and the U.S. But these days, he didn't talk about gradual things or staged issue. I'm sure it's a longer term, and in his mind, it's a long-term plan, but I think he expects some kind of breakthrough. And and notice that he changed the, the Korean's role from broker to guide. So in Korean, 중매 or 중개. 
to Giljabi. Giljabi means guide. That means he wants to be involved, and then actually he wants to have a trilateral summit right after U.S. North Summit. So we don't want to be left out, as, as Mr. Dr. Seymour talked about. And we have, on the one hand, the Trump factor, which means positive factor. But at the same time, Trump risk. Because if he made deal with the North Korea without thinking of Korean and, you know, interest. So in that sense, he's really careful about this inter-Korean summit. And he want to be a preparatory good preparatory meeting for uh, U.S. North Summit, but somehow he wants to guide the direction as well as limit. So when you say he wants to be a guide, there are a couple of ways you could do that. He mm. could lay out the principles, but the other is he's highly aware that he's dealing with two pretty volatile right. world leaders. Right. Does he see himself as the go-between, because in any negotiation with North Korea, you're going to have crises, you're going to have moments where the President Trump is going to say, we're veering toward war, you're going to have moments where the North Koreans are going to say, deal's off, we're not giving up our stuff. Does he see himself in the role of running back and forth between Kim Jong-un and President Trump? Yeah, he did, actually, last year. We saw a lot of his zigzag move. It's, on the one hand, he really criticized, unlike like a progressive leaders before Kim Dae Jung War, and once from the progressive side they called him Moon Gun Hae. <laughs> that that's to tell you that how you know disappointed from the progressive. But but on the on the other hand, like a Berlin Declaration or or his speech in the Liberation Day, and his offer. So in a way, his he try to build confidence, trust on both sides. Actually, I heard he failed when he met for the first time with Clinton. I mean, I mean Trump, I'm sorry. Trump, he tried to lay out detailed roadmaps to him. That's, that didn't work. And he wants to put some kind of input to Trump, but not by, you know, giving them really detailed roadmap. That, it, does, it wouldn't work, and it didn't work. So that means he actually learned how to deal with the Trump. And that's by telling him at every moment that it was it's President Trump's him, idea. Praising him. Right. And then mm -hmm. making ground on the mood. And every, every time, I think that's the, a really valuable experience for him when he postponed U.S.-Korea, I mean, U.S.-Korea joint military session. Actually, he didn't concert or he didn't uh, talk about with Trump before he declared on the train with NBC interviews, he said he wishes to postpone. Mm. But right after that, Trump, actually, but Nikki Haley and McMaster said you had uh, too much champagne. But <laughs> Trump, he said 100% support. At this moment, summit and about the declaration of ending war too. I think he praised him at the same time, draw from him like a blessing of that. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a bit. Um, John, we had the remarkable sight uh, a few weeks ago, just two weeks ago, of um, Kim Jong Un's armored train making it all the way uh, to Beijing. Um, looked pretty luxurious. We'd take that for the Amtrak Corridor Express any time. Um, but uh, once he got there, and he goes through this remarkable three-day visit, very much like a state visit. His wife came. He had other members of the entourage. They put on big dinners and so forth. What do you believe? that Xi Jinping's message to Kim was there, and what do you think the Chinese are worried about right now? Well, uh, <laughs> Professor Kim early mentioned that uh, he didn't get uh, too much payment from uh, uh, Moon Jae-in, so he couldn't uh, advise more. Uh, <laughs> uh, in my case, uh, I didn't get any 
uh, payment from Beijing, so I couldn't uh, know more details because of my paycheck from American University in Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, so I have to make it clear that's only my understanding of what exactly happened there. Uh, I guess we all understand that, that uh, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, surprising in a way. Uh, I still remember uh, when we were in Washington, D.C., uh, together with the two visitors, uh, Korean specialists, we, we were having lunch. And then we talk about this uh, rumor that uh, because there uh, was a number of rumors already a couple of days before the official announcement, uh, saying uh, uh, Kim Jong-un arrived in Beijing, there would be a secret visit. And everybody on the table say, no, that's not true. You know, that was very interesting to see. Uh, and also we understand that uh, this visit Actually, it's uh, requested by Kim Jong-un himself uh, with uh, Xi Jinping uh, give some certain conditions. One of them is that you have to put denuclearization uh, as an open statement. Uh, so, and among others, of course, also repair uh, Beijing-Pyongyang relations. Uh, situation like that. Uh, having said that, uh, we have to understand uh, the, what's happening over the past few years regarding internal debates in Beijing uh, among policy uh, elites and also uh, among uh, uh, policy makers. Uh, there are many schools of thoughts. Uh, but if I just put that into a, a simple way, the two camps, uh, so-called, uh, uh, around the question whether China should abandon North Korea. Uh, there was a real debate around that issue. Uh, one school of thought uh, saying yes, and so-called, uh, you know, qi chao pai, to give up. Korea. And the other said, no, uh, we should not abandon that so-called Bao Chao Pai. We should stick to North Korea. So each side has argument uh, around the question actually is all from what would be the best of a China's national interest. Uh, you know, from public image of North Korea uh, has been very negative. Uh, many people, public, I mean, citizens, ordinary citizens, regard North Korea as something like cultural revolution of China, saying, well, North Korea uh, no longer an asset to China. It sh it's already uh, has become liability. Now to mention nuclear test, now to mention the potential pollution across border to Manchuria area. Uh, so that was regarded as a real threat to China's uh, public safety and security, among others. So that kind of argument. But there is a counter-argument saying, well, actually, strategically, it's important. China should keep leverage uh, with both North Korea and South Korea. Furthermore, China should not abandon uh, North Korea because it would be a risk that North Korea may move to Washington. So, that's, so, so those are the two different camps. And John, finally, yes. You've, you've laid out uh, two different positions quite yes. well for us. Yeah. Let me just ask you quickly before I move this on. There's an assumption in Washington, it might be wrong, there's an assumption in Washington that what the Chinese want here is the status quo. The only thing that they're terribly interested in is talk Donald Trump down from all this discussion of bombing the North Koreans and don't actually get the North Koreans to do very much, just get them into a lengthy process that keeps this thing dragging on forever, 
because they don't want the Americans coming up on the, to their border, and they don't want North Korea to collapse, but they also don't want a crisis that's going to bring Donald Trump in. Um, do you think that that's what they're working toward right now, basically finding a way to maintain the status quo? Well, maintaining status quo, I guess, it's kind of undecisive when you couldn't make policy consensus. You just do nothing. So that has been the case until recently. Remember uh, Pyeongchang Olympics? Uh, there has been a lot of diplomatic maneuvering and uh, uh, lead to uh, the day after tomorrow, the summit. Uh, and all the way, the announcement uh, of a Trump uh, came meeting, and China was kind of, in my understanding, uh, it's a kind of a pushed. You have to make a decision. You know what? What do you? What do you, you, you? You cannot, like you said, you suggest status quo. China has to be proactive. So that is what happened. What's happening with it with the right. Xi Jinping's meeting? Uh, this time, uh, it's it's very, and also China is afraid of being marginalized and reduced its influence. So, so all of that, uh, not to mention that China has its own uh, stakes, uh, uh, not only so-called uh, uh, responsible stakeholder, uh, but it has its true national interest as well. So I want to get everybody in here, but Gary, you look like you had a quick point you wanted to make. And yeah, I just of, wanted to... Mm -hmm. You know, to add yeah. to what Professor uh, Zhao said, yeah. uh, China is absolutely crucial to the success of any U.S.-North Korea negotiations. Because if China stops implementing sanctions, then the U.S. loses most of its bargaining leverage. And I've already heard there's been some slippage of Chinese enforcement of sanctions, which may reflect to some extent Chinese unhappiness about m being marginalized by the negotiations that are coming up. North-South talks on peace regime, and U.S.-North Korea talks on the nuclear issue. Where's China? China is not involved in these negotiations. But it's also a terrible time for the U.S. and China to be fighting over trade and Taiwan. I mean, this is not going to help coordination with China to maintain sanctions pressure on North Korea. And you had a quick point? Yes. Uh, actually, I have a question for you, Dr. Seymour. Actually, there is uh, uh, another suspicion, actually, uh, uh, about the U.S. strategy toward China actually maintaining status quo. Because I think Richard Bush talked about this and wrote about this. The biggest problem of U.S. policy toward, toward North Korea is whether it's not deciding yet whether to use North Korea to contain China or, or for Northeastern strategy or really want to solve the North Korean problem. In that sense, maybe in this process, because there are, I think uh, Donald Trump is just, you know, technically or not the strategic person, especially in the sense of U.S. global strategy. So he wants to solve, and he decided to solve the North Korean issues. But McMaster and the other strategists, they think without having or building up some kind of North Korea, Northeast Asian strategy, especially uh, trilateral cooperation between China, Japan, and Korea. And if solved, then they're losing the good, very important leverage to contain uh, to or balance against Chinese rise. I think there, there's, it, so in that sense, McMaster really eager to block or oppose, I heard, uh, Trump decided to set the date and uh, decide to meet Kim Jong Un. Well, we want to take it one more time. So, Tanaka mm -hmm. you and Andre have been very, uh, very patient. So, uh, <laughs> uh, tell us um, first of all, what about this makes Prime Minister Abe nervous? Or maybe I should ask the question another way: <laughs> What about this doesn't make Abe nervous? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, before I respond to that question in an honest way, I would like to respond to the sure. uh, question he raised and Gary, your response as well. I think it is crucial in order to have, in order to succeed in the process of denuclearization, China should declare 
that China is prepared to abandon North Korea. That is the only way for us to see the successful completement of denuclearization. But currently, Trump is doing precisely a contradictory thing to that, because as Gary talked about, China may have had strong wish to settle this issue of North Korea, but yet the United States has been coming up with the question of Taiwan and also the question of trade. So now China thought that what is a basic stance on the part of China? Let us, let us on the part of China, make this North Korea as a leverage mm -hmm. to the United States. So you must tell to President Bush, I mean, President <laughs> Trump, that you have to be strategic. But yes, responding to your question, uh, I spent almost 30 years on the subject. I am the first Japanese who heard from uh, US intelligence community that North Korea was starting to develop nuclear weapon in 1989, 30 years since then. 1989, you said. 89, and I spent one whole year negotiating with North Korea prior to Prime Minister uh, Koizumi's trip to North Korea in 2002. Had that work out? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Abe, Prime Minister Abe, more or less has the same experience. He's the one, I think probably he's the only political leader in the world who started his sort of engagement regarding North Korea at an early stage. Same as mine. He was deeply involved in the question of the Prime Minister's trip to North Korea. And I think probably he is saying that let us not be uh, too naive. North Korea is a difficult entity. We don't want any political show. We don't want any political show of inter-Korean uh, inter summit or DPRK, United States summit. Let us have the denuclearization possible. And I'm afraid to say that this process is a long-term process. I wish Trump, President Trump resolved this overnight, but it's not possible given the nature of the issue. This is a denuclearization process. This is not Libya. China, I mean, sorry, <laughs> North Korea has developed nuclear weapons very close to the real weapon. Therefore, it would be a long-term process. I'm not siding with the North Korean argument of phasing denuclearization. We must be prepared. We must be prepared to see this process prolonging <coughs> for some time. The most important question for us all to ask ourselves is what process should we have in a, that long-term process of denuclearization? In my view, I do think, as Prime Minister Abe says, we need to have pressure, pressure, effective pressure, inclusive of Chinese pressure on North Korea. But pressure is not suffice, alone is not suffice. Pressure needs to be accompanied by three C's. I say, one, coordination. Coordination particularly among United States, South Korea, Japan, and China. Because effective pressure or relaxation of pressure needs to be orchestrated by those countries. The second is the contingency planning. Nobody knows when North Korea will explode. With all this pressure, we need to be prepared how to cope with North Korean explosion or North Korean collapse of it. I was about to say explosion or implosion, what do you think? Is Whichever. Okay. We must be prepared how to deal with all these uh, uh -huh. refugees and you know, nuclear, nuclear arsenals and all sorts of things. The third element is communication channel. At any time, we need to have communication channel. I wish South Korea maintain, not just you know, the summit, but yet much more officials level talks, and I would very much like to see the United States maintain the uh, communication channel as well. And it appears it, uh, that the uh, United States is using CIA for this. 
And there is a reason for this. When I negotiated with North Korea, at that time it was military general, but he has got a intelligence background. Why? Because all the information uh, is being held by intelligence community in North Korea. It's not, I mean, foreign ministry doesn't have any information at all. So, in North Korea, the intelligence community is probably only entity who knows about the world. Therefore, most probably, the CIA is the, you know, the entity who is negotiating with North Korea. So, and, as and I once said, Pompeo gets uh, confirmed as Secretary of State, does he bring that CIA unit over with him to basically run these? I think so. I think I so. I don't know, but yet. So, let me complete by saying that this is P plus P3C. P3C. Pressure with three Cs. P3C is a reconnaissance airplane which could detect submarines. So remember P3C. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andre, nobody has more successfully crawled inside the minds of the North Korean leadership than you, and you've written uh, very insightfully about it. So, um, on the one hand, the people around Kim Jong-un have to be a little bit nervous right now. They've got to be thinking to themselves, boy, he's putting a lot of stuff out on the table really, really fast. He's operating at a pace that his father never operated on and that his grandfather only operated on in the last months of his life when he was negotiating the 1994 uh, agreement. Um, their second thought must be, we sure hope he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And their third thought must be, we sure hope he's not going to go give up a weapons program that, as Gary points out, he was bequeathed as the last piece of survival that he has. So, if you believe that he's not really planning to give it up, are we on a collision course here where two leaders meet, reach some vague agreement, and then as they go home and things start falling apart, we're on a road to confrontation? Well, uh, first of all, I believe that it's pretty much impossible uh, that North Korean government is serious about denuclearization. Because, well, as it has been said here a number of times, uh, North Korean government has spent, has been working on the project for 70 years. They have seen what has happened to countries which agreed to surrender its nuclear weapons mm -hmm. or failed to develop it, like Iraq tried but could not. And they believe that the nuclear weapons... Libya. Libya is the best example, of course. Mm -hmm. Ukraine, too, is in regard to international guarantees of security. Mm -hmm. But Libya is above all, uh, because, as everybody knows, once Gaddafi accepted exactly the same deal Americans are insisting now on in regard to North Korea, and when revolution erupted, he could not use his air superiority because of the no-fly zone and responsibility to protect and everything else. So they believe, with good reasons, I would say, that if they surrender nuclear weapons, regime collapse is only a question of time. If, if it happens, they all are going to be killed. So I believe that in the highly unlikely cases, uh, if, say, Kim Jong-un goes mad or idealistic and agrees to surrender nuclear weapons, it's probably the only case when he should be afraid of his family, his generals, his officials, everybody. But it's not going to happen. Let's not worry about him. He is not going to surrender nuclear weapons. Everything is under control. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I believe that recent developments were quite good. Uh, why did they agree to negotiate, and as a matter of fact, why they are making such large con uh, uh, concessions even before the beginning of the actual negotiations? I, uh, it seems to be a Trump factor which is vital. We have a very unusual, unconventional president in the White House, and the North Koreans probably suspect that he might be the person who will risk a war who will risk a military strike with all possible consequences, 
in order to get rid of the North Korean nuclear weapons. So they don't want to be shot at, and they increasingly worry about Chinese attitude to the sanctions, because China is quite serious on sanctions, which is unusual. And so far, sanctions have not had much impact on the economy, but it seems to be the question of time. And because North Korean economy is growing, I never tired of repeating that North Korea is a poor country, but under Kim Jong-un, it has experienced an approximation of an economic boom. And it's one of the reasons why he is quite popular. And if it suddenly ends, well, he will become quite unpopular with his own people, and it's risky too. So they decided to negotiate, not denuclearization, but a series, seri a series of really serious concessions. And this is good. Because negotiations ceased to be a possible option at least 10 years ago, more actually, in 2002, during the second Korean crisis. But it's still possible to stop the slow motion move towards a disaster. Because it's possible to now achieve not only moratorium on nuclear tests and missile tests, but also partial dismantlement of their nuclear facilities and to make sure that for the foreseeable future, North Koreans will be unable and maybe just also unwilling to further advance their nuclear potential. Maybe for a few years, maybe for decade, maybe more God knows, for some time. And this is a major success. And we should make most of what is happening now. We should <coughs> not have unrealistic expectations. North Korea is run by Machiavellian, smart, pragmatic people who are by no means suicidal. They're not going to surrender nuclear weapons. But they are willing to negotiate serious concessions because they are seriously terrified. So and when, when I hope it will be used. Yeah. When you say that um, they're not going to give them up, but they do want to negotiate, and there's a theory afoot, and you see it a little bit from just reading the North Korean statements, that they want to be accepted as a nuclear power the way Pakistan is, that if they get into a negotiation with Donald Trump, it's basically about arms control. Yes. You give up X, we give up Y, and it be, they begin to be resembling an acknowledged nuclear state. I, Would the United States be making a big mistake at this point by acknowledging them as a nuclear state, or why not just get into that arms control mode on the theory that it's the best thing we've got going? Judging by what has been reportedly said by Kim Jong-un, recently, and he reportedly told the South Korean delegation that he is committed to denuclearization because this is what his grandfather once promised. Well, it's definitely taken out of context because his grandfather meant something completely different, but it's irrelevant. Uh, I do not expect North Korea to take such a stance now. Frankly, I did expect it until, say, later last year. And then it became clear that President Trump has succeeded in terrifying everybody. Not only your humble self, not only my wife, but even Kim Jong-un himself. <laughs> so I do not expect that North Koreans will really insist on this kind of equal treatment. What it seems to be more likely, they will just promise denuclearization, pay lip service to their commitment, and package the coming deal, not as a kind of arms restrictions, negotiations, but as um, the first step of, on a long way towards the shiny goal of full, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization in some very distant point in the future. Uh, so, and if it's going to happen, if they don't say we are nuclear power, we are negotiating our arms control, if they're saying, well, we also, of course, we want to denuclearize, maybe not right now, this issue of de facto acceptance them of the nuclear power will be so resolved. If, however, they insist on this type of equal partners negotiation, I think it's probably not a good idea. And right now, maybe it's possible to push situation back to the lip service to make them to, again, openly pay lip service to denuclearization, and then, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I have a different opinion, I, yes. if, even if we have a similar ties here. <laughs> okay. I think we have kind of, we are in a kind of path dependence kind of thinking framework. I think if we really uh, carefully study his comment, 
I think he's definitely a different, different uh, 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 leader, as I said, as a pragmatism too. And I, I think he's in the middle of strategic decisions. You know, the biggest difference is, you know, many people talk about the denuclearization is all different meaning from all, for all parties, US, Korea, and the North. I don't think it's, it's, it's that, that difficult question. The final form is CVID, no question about it. But Korea and the US think it's, without, you know, except the CVID, nothing is denuclearization. I don't think so. It's a process. So North Korea is doing process of denuclearizing. But until CVID, especially you know, Americans, especially the hardliners, don't accept it is as part of denuclearization. Yes, they can go back. They can reverse, but they are moving forward. And why do that? And as, as you said, they, I think it's, this is out of confidence at the, you know, as well as a fear. And because he completed it, he had now, you know, complete, he has a nuclear bombs. I think he has three cars now. First car, he throw, which is a future, future nuclear, ICBM and moratorium. Second, even he can uh, have a, he can, uh, you know, have a U.S. inspection team and the, the verify the current program. Even if he gave up, he still have made one, like 2030s conservatively or 100 bombs. He can have until the last moment. Here, two trust issues in encounter. U.S. can trust. I don't think it's already, this is totally different from nine, September 19 framework, six party. At the time, verification, we can verify. But now, we can, cannot verify. Even we can send one million people to inspect whole North Korea. It's not possible. That means, ironically, this is the stage we have to trust somehow North Korea, voluntarily giving up. At the same time, North Korea should have a trust. When they give up, they can guarantee of their security. So this second part, current program is the very sensitive. It's going to take time. But if he's showing or he, he shows in the, in the middle of the negotiation, then he is ready to give up made one, complete a nuclear bomb. Maybe this verification of the current nuclear program can be easily solved. So, um, Gary, Mr. Kim has raised this question of verification. You and I were talking about it a little before the session began. Um, of all of the verification problems that you have dealt with in 30 years of doing this, this has got to be the nightmare of verification of all time. Mountainous country right. and American intelligence agencies that differ in their own assessment of how many nuclear weapons they are from the CIA's 20, 25 to the DIA's 60, right? So you don't know what the universe is you're looking for. More mountains than you can count, tunnels under every one of them. Uh, I don't even understand how you start on verification on this one. Right. Well, as I said earlier, I think verification has to start with a North Korean declaration. Right. You have to know what's on the table. What's the universe? What are you haggling about? And I agree with you, North Korea is a far more difficult verification challenge than Libya, Iran. First of all, the program is much more extensive, so there's much more stuff to account for, more facilities, more materials, more people. And secondly, as you said, we know much less. In the case of Libya and Iran, we had at least some independent check on whatever the Libyans or the Iranians declared. So we had a little bit of confidence that we at least had our arms around the problem. In the case of North Korea, that simply isn't the case. And, we're, and frankly, I don't think we'll ever, as you know, you know, I agree with Professor Kim, I don't think we'll ever be 100% confident. If Kim Jong-un said, I've got 46 nuclear weapons, I used up six of them in my tests, we're never going to know with right. absolute mm -hmm. certainty that that 40 is everything they have. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible. But you can at least uh, narrow the margin of error so that you know that you're in the ballpark. I think that's the best you can do. 
Uh, but just to say quickly, what I said earlier is that until the North Koreans make a declaration that acknowledges nuclear facilities outside of the ones which are well known and have been inspected for many, many years, you can't even start a verification process. Tanaka-san? We don't have to speak for North Korea because you talked about trust, but it was North Korea who has been betraying us all the way through. And as you say, verification is very, very difficult. As you say, this would have to be a long-term process, but yet the important thing is we would have to make it happen. We would have to make it possible. For that purpose, we need to have leverage in between. That's the reason why I say, let us coordinate ourselves so that we could either maintain strong sanction. If North Korea were to cheat, let us impose additional sanction. So that is a question of leverage against North Korea. I mean, North Korea, Kim Jong-un says, we shall denuclearize. Let us stick to his words and to make sure that will happen. For that, we need to be prepared to, you know, to do some type of devices to make it happen. That's all. We don't have to speak for them. So, John, there's another way from doing this. I mean, we could send in the IEA and have them go search and all that. But the country that's closest to this, that has the capability to go search for nuclear weapons, could be highly intrusive if they wanted to be, but probably don't want to be, is China. Well, we have to understand uh, what's the ultimate purpose of uh, North Korea, uh, that is regime survival. Uh, and nuclear is uh, the way uh, to sort of guarantee regime survival. So, I agree with uh, Tanaka-san's assessment. Uh, that is, as long as we maintain, if we use Trump's term, maximum pressure or sanction, so that would directly threaten regime survival, then that would push North Korea uh, to do uh, the things we would like to, you know, we just discussed. Unfortunately, I also agree with the early discussion that is, at a certain stage, China almost ready, if you think about the not only UN security resolution sanctions, but also China cut off oil, gas, and close the factory and ask all the employers from, and also the <coughs> restaurants from China, and also bank, uh, you know, transactions. It's almost there to give certain pressure and to move. That's why Kim Jong-un got really, I would, my assessment is got a panic. So mm -hmm. move to Washington, move to Beijing uh, for this uh, movement. And so we all understand that uh, uh, Kim family from grandfather to father to himself is expert of game play play among uh, big powers, Russia, former Soviet Union, China, and now Washington, Beijing. Uh, if, unfortunately, I agree that uh, Trump's recent movement with China in this particular case is counterproductive. Okay. Because almost like a uh, wake-up call to Beijing, that is, don't do hush. Don't push North Korea, because we need North Korea. Think about other issues, trade war, Taiwan, South China Sea. You know, in those kind of occasions, why should we, from Beijing's perspective, sure. to put that much pressure? So the key, actually, to me, is U.S.-China. If U.S.-China can stick together, just like earlier few months, then North Korea would really under pressure, and that would make things easier. Uh, but now, uh, Kim Jong-un really had some opportunities to think, to have a second thought, to maintain the nuclear weapon. So, um, 
Andre, when I do my reporting in Washington and I ask the question, okay, what timeline do you have in mind in which you go and you do this? Remembering that we've been through the 1992 um, North-South Agreement, which agreed already to denuclearization, and here we are uh, 16 years la later, I'm sorry, 26 years later, and we're mm -hmm. not much closer. We had an agreement um, in 94. We had an agreement in 2005. Um, so it's not as if the North Koreans have not declared for denuclearization before. Um, what I hear when I ask this question in the administration, they say two things. First, they've never encountered the likes of Donald Trump before. You've heard a little bit of this on the panel, that he's basically, his unpredictability has scared them, the Nixon madman theory side, okay? And the second thing they say is, um, we don't think you need a timeline of years. We basically think you can deliver them a FedEx box, have it prepaid to Tennessee, <laughs> have them drop their nuclear equipment into it, and then we'll have a discussion with them. Um, what do you think is the fastest this could be done, if it can be done at all? I don't think it can. If you mean full denuclear, if you mean full denuclearization. Well, what I mean is for something that would enable President Trump to get out and claim victory here. Oh, he is quite good in claiming victories. Uh, so I think that uh, partial concessions will work quite well. Uh -huh. And it can be done well by June. If you s talk about serious denuclearization, well, I think it's not, go it's not achievable. The North Korean side will work hard to make kind of the, to agree on the date of arrival, which should be after the next elections, at least. Mm -hmm. I hope that uh, the U.S. voter will change his her mind and will have a different, more conventional president, which will make life in Pyongyang much easier. Uh, so, well, whether so, so their game is, if you can wait a little less than three years and stretch this thing out, yes. Donald yes. Trump will have failed in the one objective he said he's going to succeed at. He told me during the campaign, every American president has messed this thing up, and. I'm not going to go make the same incremental mistakes they've made. And you're arguing they can stretch them out and get mm -hmm. them to make those same incremental mistakes. I, I think so, because frankly, you know, in 70 years, North Koreans have outsmarted Russians many times, Chinese countless times, South Koreans, well, difficult to count how many Americans too. <laughs> I don't see why they will not outsmart Trump. <laughs> <laughs> And once again, I sound very, very skeptical, but once again, it's a very good situation. Right. In spite of all my irony about Mr. Trump, which is shared by a considerable part of the American political class, I would admit, well, he, is do he has succeeded. He has managed to push North Koreans to the negotiation table, and judging by their behavior, they are accepting far more kind of far tougher conditions they would accept otherwise. And talking about you ones, uh, can, if they just dismantle part of their nuclear facilities, give some fissile material, and they will tell they don't have that much left, he can claim victory. Okay. It's realistic. So if the talks drag on for two or three years, but North Korea continues to observe the moratorium mm -hmm. on missile testing, yeah. Trump can claim. Yeah that his tough policies have prevented North Korea from demonstrating a credible capacity to attack the United States. So from Trump's standpoint, having the missile test moratorium in place is, I think, a significant achievement. It's not as good as getting a freeze on fissile material or partial destruction of North Korea's nuclear weapons or missile force, but it's still an important achievement that slowed down the program. So, Gary, let's, let's take your argument that it's important. Um, I remember being out in um, Russia with um, Secretary of State Tillerson. Remember him? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, last year. And he made the argument that a freeze, which this essentially would be, yeah. is useless to the United States, that it merely enshrines the status quo, that there's no way that the Trump administration would settle for it, 
Right. Sure, it might be the first step toward, but you can't just live with a freeze. And you're telling me that Donald Trump will claim the freeze as a great victory. Well, I think as Andre says, Donald Trump knows how to make lemonade out of lemons. Mm -hmm. And if the only thing he has to sell is a extended moratorium on testing, he can say, and I think the technical experts would support it, that without North Korean demonstrating a full range test of an ICBM with a survivable reentry vehicle, they don't have a demonstrated capacity to attack the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And you know, just on the freeze, I, I'm not really confident we'll get a freeze on fissile material production because I said, as I said, the verification requirements are so onerous that I'm not at all convinced that North so Korea he would agree to that. So he would come up then with basically a third of an Iran agreement. If you... Yeah, exactly. That may be the best, best that can be achieved. Yeah, actually, the the, if that's the case, then yeah, as you said, it's what's better than the Iran deal? Always, Trump is, is always competing with uh, Obama. And actually, luckily enough, he destroyed all what you know, Obama did, but he's now chance that Obama couldn't do it. Then he wants to you know, solve this problem and declare winning yeah. over Obama. Yeah. So I think he has yeah. a really intention to solve completely. Yeah. But is it possible? I think Kim Jong-un, I think, like I say, Moon, four years, because he's in the remaining term. Trump, two years, and Kim Jong-un, two years. And many people are suspicious about his one, he wants to drag down, but I don't think so. Really, North Korea, when I met them in Helsinki and everywhere, the indication that they, are, they have been stressed about changing regimes in Korea, in the US. So if price is right, don't, don't get me wrong, if price is right, much higher than before, but I think it's, it's two years. Tanaka-san, you had something you wanted to add there? Sure. It appears to me that you have no confidence whatsoever in Trump. Uh, let, let, let's think about this. Suppose that the United States, Trump, were to negotiate and agree with North Korea for the partial arrangement, just freeze or destroyance of the ICBMs. U.S. alliance relationship with the rest of the world will be very severely undermined. Yeah. Very severely undermined. Yeah, because nuclear North Korea, I think everybody agrees that no, nuclear North Korea is destabilizing to the region. What Korea would do with North Korean nuclear weapon? Yes, the United States will be willing to, to freeze the nuclear testing, U.S. is willing to go along with ICBMs, or to destroy ICBMs. What about Korea? What about Japan? Quite destabilizing. So let us very clearly say to the world that we don't want that. John, yeah. scrape you into this, Most and, and Gary and we'll uh, open yeah. it up for some questions here. Most of argument earlier, myself included, pessimistic. That is what we could do. But I have to say there are also optimistic way of thinking. Uh, you ask uh, what Xi Jinping would like Kim Jong-un to do. Remember during this visit, Xi Jinping took Kim to Zhongguanchun, to Academy of Science, to see the achievement, you know, open and reform, Gaige Kaifang. So that's all along, you know, from Jiang Zemin, from uh, Hu Jintao, now Xi Jinping, would like to see North Korea open and reform, which, of course, it's the likelihood is still very low, but Given the condition, if the regime less threatened, then, you know, remember recently uh, Kim talked about from one priority, military, nuclear, to dual priorities, military plus economic development. I guess that kind of sign cannot rule out 
that North Korea uh, may, under certain conditions, of course, I'm not that, my personal, I'm not that optimistic, but I have to point out that's another way of thinking. Gary? Yeah. So if Trump just focuses on the U.S. security and leaves the allies exposed, the logical con conclusion is that South Korea and Japan will build their own nuclear weapons to defend themselves. And we know from a very famous interview that uh, Donald Trump gave with our moderator during, when he was a candidate that he thought that was a pretty good idea. Why shouldn't Korea and Japan have nuclear weapons and the U.S. can save the money that we spend having our forces uh, stationed States, in Japan and Korea? The United States has a public institutions such as the military or state department or all sorts of things. I am entirely sure that those public ins institutions even you represent would be opposed to that type of thing. I would the, be opposed, but I'm not, not president of the United States. Whether or not States. Japan go, goes <laughs> nuclear or not, that is the absolute decision on the part of Japan. I don't think Japan will, but yet this is going to be very significantly destabilizing in the region. Who welcomes that? I agree. I don't so, think Trump will welcome so that. So before we go out to the, the audience, just to circle in on this point. So um, the way that the president said this as a candidate came out of a discussion about his desire to pull American troops out of the Pacific. And I said to him, well, if you do that, the South Koreans and the Japanese are not going to believe in your nuclear deterrent. Uh, so they're going to be tempted to go off and build their own. Are you okay with that? And there was sort of a long silence, and then he said, yes, he was okay with it. And he repeated it several times. I came back to him several times. It's interesting he has not said that as president. How do you read that? <laughs> Maybe he knows that's not to be said in polite company. <laughs> Who knows what he says in private? not usually been a restriction in the past. Uh, but, uh, exactly. Okay, so let's grab a few uh, questions out here. We're going to start with Evans. And uh, I think, are there some microphones around? Somebody, someone's running down to you. Right down in front here. Great panel. Thank you very much for this. Um, Gary, earlier on, and then circled back to it later on, laid out a scenario in, in which uh, President Trump might uh, try to declare victory uh, by getting something that enhances uh, U.S. security in some tangible way, uh, unfortunately, possibly at the expense of leaving in place uh, some level of threat against America's ally. And the, uh, the discussion ended on a shared sense of concern about that. Uh, like Gary, I believe there is some possibility that the president might go down that route uh, and seek an outcome that significantly enhances, enhances U.S. Uh, capability of uh, uh, defense. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, Kim Jong-un the other day in announcing the ICBM freeze yes, was targeting precisely that point when absolutely he announced that. Right. Um, we remember that in Pompeo's confirmation hearing, not just once, but twice, he defined the US DPRK summit, the goal of that summit, as enhancing America's security against North Korea's nuclear threat. Twice. And at the G7 meeting uh, a few days ago, an unnamed senior American official used almost the same words to define what the American goal was. Uh, Japanese friends, including those here today, uh, but in uh, private conversations, have expressed profound concern bordering on outrage at, at that sort of outcome uh, of the summit. I have heard nothing from the ROK government, and I have seen virtually nothing in the South Korean press expressing concern about that outcome. Can someone please explain why? Who wants to take that up? I thought it's a question, at the beginning, question to you, but I think at the end, you yeah, realize that's a question to me. Uh, surprise? And maybe, <laughs> uh, yeah, surprise. Maybe too much euphoria, I think that's the problem, but at the same time, because 
yeah, that's Trump risk, as I, uh, as I talked about. But uh, because we are that determined, and actually, it's, ironically enough, the moon is determined to accomplish denuclearizations. In that sense, then, I don't think the U.S. really is satisfied with that, especially even though uh, Trump, you know, has colored it or as, as a victory, I don't think everybody accepted it. So, it, yeah, he can declare that, but I don't think it's it accepted by any, any, any actors. There was a question right here. Yeah. So I have Mike coming to you. <coughs> yeah. I think uh, it's a good discussion, but it has missed a very important point. That is, uh, if supposedly North Korea is willing to or promise to give up the nuclear things almost completely and demand something in return, what can we offer him? For example, if North Korea require, uh, requires legal and written security guarantee from the United States, yeah. Is Trump willing to provide that? So that is, without this, mm -hmm. our story is not complete. Right. Great right. question. So Gary, yeah. um, Donald Trump doesn't usually go into a negotiation talking very much about right. what he's preparing to give up, mm -hmm. but what do you think he's preparing to give up? So in my experience in dealing with the North Koreans, they always start the negotiations by emphasizing security assurances and guarantees, but somewhere in the course of the negotiation, you find out that that's mostly smoke and mirrors. What they really want is material benefit, whether it's rice or cash or energy facilities or heavy fuel oil. So I think this negotiation will come down to what can they get from uh, China and from the ROK in terms of material benefit, yep. development assistance, money, uh, as well as sanctions relief, of course. And when the North Koreans say normalization of relations with the United States, they're not talking about a couple of U.S. diplomats sitting in Pyongyang. They're talking about lift all the sanctions, promote trade and investment in North Korea. So I think this will come down to a money question, much more than security. And what will Trump give? I'm sure he'd be quite happy to build Trump Towers in Pyongyang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, they have had trouble with that out of plum hotel. He can, he can help with that. Andre, you had something you wanted to add? I would, uh, I, I would basically agree with what Gary said, but at this time they probably, because we're facing a slightly unusual situation, they will probably worry about both. I believe that they need at least two things. First, a promise that they are not going to be shot at. A promise that Americans will not use armed force. And second, partial lifting of the sanctions. Because they understand that if sanctions are rolled back to, say, 2015 level, they can do reasonably well under such situations, because their economy was growing quite fast under sanctions until recently. And it will also open gates for economic interaction with South Korea. And the Moon government here is extremely favorable about the idea of economic exchanges and aid and semi-aid, all kinds of projects with South Korea. So once the major obstacle, UN security can, sanctions are removed, partially at least, they can come to Seoul asking for money and they will get a lot. Let's wait for just a second. Let's come in there. Thanks very much, Dave. Great discussion, everybody. Uh, Chris Nelson, doing Nelson Report, writing about this stuff all the time. Um, it's been fascinating, and particularly that it took really up until almost the end that we got to Evans's question, which was something that we've all been talking about for a couple of days. Uh, that, you know, what about the existing weapons, not what they might have? We certainly agree that it's good if you can remove the threat of the ICBM, because then it removes the threat of putting a bomb on top of Andre next time he's in North Korea. But my question is, we've got a summit coming up pretty soon, uh, north-south. Um, what is on the table with the two that deals with the existing threat in conventional terms? You know, uh, the first time I came here, I heard about 10,000 artillery pieces on the DMZ. This was, I hate to say it, 40 years ago, you know. They're still there, right? And you've got troops, you've got all kinds of stuff. Is that a topic for lowering of tensions? Is that something that we can look for as a deliverable at this coming summit? 
uh, or is that down the road? Because it seems to me that would help start this process of mutual confidence and, yeah, we're not really coming for you this time, maybe, you know, all that stuff. Is that something to look and at? It's more of a South Korea issue as well. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah because this is called the Korean Peninsula. You know, and you guys are getting the first crack at a real public, ne right. public negotiation. So is that something to look for? Yeah, actually, my government already declared that it's, it's, uh, let me, let me, I think I did, it, this is like three plus one, three main agenda, denuclearization and peace system and the inter-Korean uh, cooperation or exchange. So, so first part is denuclearization. I think they will declare <coughs> somehow, but, but second one is regarding the point that you raised in that sense and, and, and ending the, and, you know, declaring the ending war too. And actually, North Korea really has been interested in like an unplanned or undesired clash between them. So it is more, more like an arms control issue. And actually, unilaterally shut up that speaker that, you know, toward North Korea is a part of it at the start. And I think they are going to talk about this in detail at, at, uh, at the meeting. Gary? So, I mean, just to be even-handed, I want to give Trump credit that I think it was very smart for him to basically bless North-South pursuit of uh, peace issues, peace mm -hmm. settlement, including confidence-building measures mm -hmm. along the DMZ, because that's fundamentally a North-South issue. And maybe Kim Jong-un is prepared to be much more flexible and actually co agree to some concrete measures that his father but never would. If he if he did that, what are the chances? I mean, his greatest benefit in doing that is to split Moon away from President Trump. If we if we agree for a minute that President Trump's main interest is getting rid of the ICBM threat, and that Moon's main interest is getting rid of the conventional threat that Chris was discussing, is that the point on which these two go off on different roads? Well, you're never going to get rid of the conventional threat, right? It's a right. question of reducing the conventional It's like the nuclear weapons. We're not right. going to get rid of the nuclear weapons. We're just going to manage hey, That can't threat. be because President Trump said he was going to solve this. And when we ask him what he means by solve this, he means getting rid of all of the nuclear weapons. Yes, I'm sure that's his objective. <laughs> I do not think he will achieve that objective. <laughs> and I don't think the blessing actually from himself. I think Moon actually sent the NSA, Jung Yong, to talk about, I and mean, he accepted it. Uh -huh. I don't think it's from, from himself. John, if, you're, um, if you are um, Xi and you're watching all of this, are you thinking to yourself, I've got to somehow get China in the middle of this discussion, lest all of this get sorted out without my presence? Well, to begin with, uh, China, a long time, not really regarded North Korea nuclear is a threat to China, is a threat to Japan, threat, you know, if there is a long range, then threat to the U.S. The only thing is the border area, the pollution. So, and, and also, uh, for a long time, China argued, this is not our problem, it's, it's America's problem, and then there is a counter-argument, that's a China problem. So, now, uh, I guess uh, it's strategically important. I guess China is more consideration on the overall strategic issue rather than concrete technical issue of nuclear because that's still regarded as part of uh, America's consideration. And also whether China really believe that America has a true intention. Remember Obama strategic patience so waited for eight years until Trump. Yeah. So, was, was so whether, whether Korea Peninsula is really on the top, uh, you know, China has a long suspicion until recently, uh, Trump administration. So, so there is still a recalculation and a consideration. Okay, right here. No, I'm, oh, okay, Hum, oh, yeah. go. no, no. You go first and then <clears throat> pass it straight back up to the young lady up there. Thank you. Great, great panel. Um, it seems to me what, what we were just discussing, though, was we're slicing the salami again. No? I mean, isn't this what... 
we had we'd been told that was not going to happen, but exactly as soon as we start talking, this is salami slicing. Right? We, we've gone through everything again, right? right? Mm -hmm. Nuclear weapons, conventional weapons. Uh, so it seems to me that the only way, it's not as if we haven't tried this slicing before. I think we've sliced it every possible way where you can imagine this thing. But has anything really changed fundamentally? Is this a dis different salami so, or do we have a different knife? I, so my, my point is that if it's the same salami, then we're, we, I think one or the other party has to be completely delusional for this to work out. That either North Korea is completely, Kim Jong-un is deluded and he gives up unbeknownst to himself, he actually does something that would so fundamentally undermine his regime, which is what we're asking for, right? Or we are so delusional that we can actually achieve something without immediate CVID, and then we end up agreeing to something, we being either President Moon or President Trump or both, we end up agreeing to something that will fundamentally undermine our security. Because imagine, right, both President Moon in, in Internet Korean Summit and then the and then Trump Kim Summit, they both come out and say that peace is at hand. And they would want to, for all the reasons you guys just came out with, they want to say something like that. Now imagine what happens, this goes to goes to what happens in South Korea. You're saying that they're white, you know. Imagine we have so much trouble getting the fad batteries to work. Imagine what happened, what would happen if peace is announced on both summits. Immediately, people, elements here in China, in so many places, was, so what are we doing with all these American troops here? Why do we need extended term? So what I'm saying is that somebody, at some side has to be completely delusional, otherwise we're not gonna get anything out of it unless something fundamental has changed and I don't think anything has changed at this point. So I'm hoping, hoping it's Kim Jong-un that's deluded, <laughs> that he's, he actually thinks that a China-like model or a Vietnam-like model, for some strange reason, he suddenly gets the idea that it may actually work, that he, he can have partial opening, he gets aid and investment like China and all, and, and that he gets to keep the nuclear weapons. He's, he's probably saying, you know, China does it and Russia does it. They, they have nuclear weapons, they are open, you know, and they have one man dictatorship and, you know, emperor, emperor for life and, hey, basically, I have the same deal, I just need to open it. Yeah, if, if, if he's delusional enough to try to do that, then he undermines his regime. That would be fantastic. But I'm not sure he's gonna, he's that delusional. So I'm, I am really worried that we're the ones who are so, completely so deluding ourselves. Another way to put uh, Chairman's question here is, after all these declarations, tell me if I have this right, that, we're, that President Trump would not make the same mistake that, he, that his predecessors made, you're saying in the salami slicing, he's making the same mistake that his predecessors made. Um, I don't know, Gary Tanaka-san? So I think when the Trump administration discovers after negotiations that they cannot force or entice Kim Jong-un to surrender his nuclear weapons, they'll have to make a choice. They can declare the negotiations are over, we tried and failed, and now we're going to go back to maximum pressure. That's one strategy. I think they're likely to find tremendous resistance from Xi Jinping and Moon Jae-in to declare that diplomacy has ended, precisely because of the fear that that will lead pretty quickly to a serious military uh, consideration. So it's going to be hard for the U.S. to resurrect the sanctions regime after six months of negotiations, because I think the patience of the Chinese and South Koreans will be much longer than that. that I mean, I think Japan will be different. Or the Trump administration will go down the road that other negotiators have, which is to try to get partial constraints on North Korea's nuclear and, program. And call it a victory. And Tanaka call it a victory. you look like you'd say you want yeah, to add the only way, you know, As I said, the key is China, again. The only way for us to be able to demonstrate to North Korea, no, you cannot survive with your nuclear weapon. And we have come to closer to that stage because of Chinese pressure on North Korea. China, indeed, took part in cutting oil, took part in cutting funds 
So, and again, the reason why Kim Jong-un rushed to China to see Xi Jinping is this is an insurance policy. In case this uh, summit meeting broke down, then there is going to be much more strong pressure on Trump for using military option. And in order to protect their own country, North Korea has gone to China, please protect us. So the only way is China declare that China is prepared to I, abandon North Korea. Yeah, I would say uh, the key is the US-China working together. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You know, Pyongyang is very good at to divide. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it seems like it's successful. And now it's very hard for China to just like uh, did before, because I'm also not clear what exactly the intention of Trump. And actually, uh, travel is the long-term question, strategic question. That is, number one, whether powers may have to recognize North Korea nuclear, number one. That's number two, I mean, if that's not weather, so I use question mark. And number two, uh, what exactly is the implication if North Korea issue solved? Actually, China prepared, like uh, Tanaka-san mentioned, openly discuss the crisis issue. Right. And you know, there's already very concrete discussion, and now stopped. Because China now figure is that really U.S. want? If, if there is no North Korea threat, what's the reason for U.S. troops here in Korea Peninsula? What's the reason for Abe to constitutional revise? Because there is no, no external. So in other words, there are a lot of uh, hypothetical Possibly. issues, strategic issues, rather than only North Korea technical issues. So, last, so the key, uh, back again, the key is I, US, US China. Hundred. US China, uh, you know, you have to re-establish re sort of mutual trust. Of course, it's, you cannot do complete trust, but we're, there must be a progress in we're, that We're way. in overtime, so. Okay, I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I need quick, to respond yeah. to what Dr. Hans Hebong actually. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I'm the only one here not the same, diff I mean, thinking differently. This is a totally different game. I don't think it's, Salami tactics is working. I don't think it's the level is going on. I'm not sure it's, that's why I called it all or nothing. But because it's, it's a, you know, considering that the importance of this the nuclear issue, actually, usually, you know, assistant secretary dealt with before. But now it's the top. Mm -hmm. we, can go, go, we cannot go higher. If we fail, we fail. And you talked about the delusion that my North Korean leader had, but maybe he is, the really at, at the crossroad, whether to survive with the pressure, under pressure, or the challenge, take a chance to be a normal leader. Maybe he's delusional, but, but maybe Trojan horse, but we can, we can make, make uh, the best of it. Thank you. Kate, not to put too much pressure on you, but you've got the last <laughs> question. So it's got to be really good, right? <laughs> Is there a microphone coming? Thanks very much. It's an honor to have the last question. Um, I just wanted to address quickly the wild card scenario that the Trump Kim summit doesn't go well for whatever unpredictable reason. Mm. How real is this risk and uh, what happens next? And what are the contingency plans, if any, that would be in place? Thanks. It's a great question because usually you save presidential summits for the end. One right. Thing, right, so here it's sort of a roll the dice all or nothing. Gary? Yeah, but if I'm right that Trump is prepared to lower the bar for the summit itself and just issue a vague political declaration and have a good photo op, the summit can't fail. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm not sure how much substantive business they're going to get done at the summit beyond um, authorizing their negotiators to begin to work out the details where all the hard work will be done. Uh, Andre, but, if that happens, how does Kim then play it? If, how does Kim play it if, um, 
if Let Gary's me. right and they authorize people to go do this, does Kim want to get this done quickly or does Kim want to get this done as slowly as he possibly can? Slow. <laughs> <laughs> the key word now is slow because a large part of Korean game, North Korean game now is winning time. Great. Well, this has been a fabulous uh, discussion. Um, it has prepared us uh, very well for the spectator sport of this Friday uh, and then the continued um, uh, wild cards of the, uh, the Trump-Kim uh, meeting. Um, I thank you uh, very much. I want to thank um, Chebong and MJ for uh, keeping such great conversations going here uh, at this. And uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for engaging so well and all of you for your questions. Um, MJ, you've got some? Hold on a sec. We, got, yeah. we, we have one bit of business to do here. Yeah. I have been a student of uh, international affairs for the last 50 years. These days, when I read the newspaper in the morning, one term, one ex expression seems to bother me a little bit. The security guarantee of North Korean regime by the US, I don't understand what it means. Mm -hmm. It is my understanding that US cannot and should not guarantee any regime's uh, security. It is North Korea's own people who can provide the sec security guarantee of the regime. I may have to study more. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a fascinating question because what is that guarantee? I mean, there was something of a security guarantee given For Gaddafi. to Gaddafi. Yes. And it, it, that didn't help him. If you go ask him how that worked out, uh, right. Anybody on this? Maybe. Sure. Uh, well, I do agree with you, because for every time I see these remarks about regime security guarantee, I'm sort of perplexed. Yes, I can imagine how the United States makes a promise of not using military force against North Korea as long as North Korea follows the simple rules A, B, C, D, E. After all, same promise have been given to Cuba after the missile crisis, and it has worked quite well. Mm. But I cannot see how can the United States, or for that matter, any other country guarantee the security of North Korean regime against any kind of domestic challenge. Uh, and I don't see American, if you have, say, a revolutionary development, revolution in North Korea, it's not something I personally would like to see, but it's possible. I, I cannot imagine, say, U.S. Marines, uh, you know, going to Pyongyang <laughs> to shoot down pro-democracy demonstrators. Okay. So I would just add, even if we gave such a guarantee, the North Koreans would not believe us. So it has zero value. Okay. And we gave one to the Ukrainians in some way. It was mm -hmm. a little more vaguely worded when they gave up their nuclear weapons. And right. It was we not even a guarantee. Their, we guaranteed was, their security against all yeah. incursions by foreign forces? No, it was, it was an assurance of consultation. Like a yeah. assurance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was quite carefully worded. Well, if, if, we, if we think about the Korea War, it, it's officially not ended. Officially. There is no peace treaty among powers. Uh, so I, I guess uh, you know, Dr. Yuji asked that question, what can we turn? One of the returns is kind of a peace treaty among powers and the U.S., China, Korea, North Korea, South Korea. Uh, you know, back to that, uh, the, that kind of at least nominally provided some framework for, for North Korea. I guess that's, that's one of the issues. Well, I thank you all. This was a great discussion and look forward to the conclusion of the, uh, of the plenum and uh, being back next year. Thank you for your wonderful discussion. Before we officially bring this year's plenum to a close, I would like to invite Dr. Ham Jae-bong to the president of the Asan Institute for Policy, Stud uh, Policy Stud Studies to the stage for his closing remarks.